Welcome back. Uh, I know we just did a broadcast, but I was led to do this one. The funny thing about it is I wasn't, I was led to put some stuff on the board, but there was something else on my heart. So we're going to wait and see how this goes on because I kind of believe what I have to say next is related to some things going on in my life that uh, need to be looked at before I introduce it. But we'll see what happens, okay? Uh, the intent of today is to talk eventually about what about the bank failures. So if I was going to give this uh, title right now, I would call it uh, Part 2, Luciferian System, uh, Bank Failures. But to get there, we're going to review a little bit and kind of explain what's going on. Now, if you've read the Bible, if you've been in church, you know the verse that says, the wind blows where it wills or wishes, and you see the effects of it. You hear the sound, uh, but you don't know where it's coming from. And then there's a, a verse that says, so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now, we're going to get into that a little bit, and I want to uh, compare it uh, pair it with what Jesus said, because Jesus said that to Nicodemus, who came to him in the, towards the end of the day, night was falling, uh, probably didn't want to be seen, but they had a pressing question, the Pharisees had a pressing question for Jesus, and that question was, basically, who are you? We see the works you're doing, but we don't understand it. It doesn't jive with our understanding of the Messiah. You're doing things that some God has to be somewhat involved in this, but we looked at the scriptures, we studied it, and we're kind of confused here. And so that's when Jesus pretty much says, Nicodemus, you must be born from above. And Nicodemus, of course, is very confused, and then he does, the wind blows. Now, he, Jesus later says, my sheep will hear my voice, and another voice they will not hear. They'll hear, they'll, they won't listen to. So that implies that um, sheep are going to hear their master's voice or the shepherd's voice, but they may hear some other voices. And Jesus goes on to say that, that uh, you got to be careful of these shepherds because the the reality is that they might end up uh, trying to hurt the sheep. And, he, and Jesus says there's many false sh shepherds out there. You know, they're going to try to uh, use the sheep. So he's, he makes this distinction. My sheep, the people who I know and they know me, um, will hear my voice and they won't listen to these other voices. Okay, so... Here's the question that we're going to start with. Oh, well, let me back up. Let's go and, and say, what does the flesh listen to? Okay. Uh, we know we have flesh. What voices, what does the flesh listen to? Does, does the flesh listen to the shepherd? No. Does the flesh listen to the wind? Well, there is a catch, catchy one there because the, 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 the flesh does listen to things that are not from the Spirit of the God and that come in the I, thoughts and ideas and, and that. So we got to keep that in mind that, that it's just not a one-sided thing. You may hear Jesus' voice. You may read the scripture and the spirit may bring something alive to you that says, oh, this is what God's about. I see this happening with a lot of people now that they're, they're kind of waking up to things and they're hearing from God, and, but they're also hearing from the other, other side, the voices they listen to, the voices that said you're worthless. You know, you'll never amount to anything. Those are voices. Those are coming from someplace. Where are they coming from? Well, um, my sheep hear my voice, but there's these other shepherds out there. So there's entities, spirits, that will speak to you in your thoughts 
and in your feelings through the flesh. So the flesh tends to look at things because this is what we got from the, uh, the fall or eating the apple. Prior to eating the apple, they knew there was a tree in the garden, the knowledge of good and evil. The fact that, that they were tempted to eat from that tree tells you one thing. They didn't know good and evil. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't have been eaten from the tree. So this idea that they understood God was good and other things were bad and that, no, they had no understanding of that. In fact, prior to eating that, what, what was their relationship with God? It was intimate. It was walking. It was walking with God in the cool of the day. It wasn't like God was, take some notes as we walk along. You know, you got to write this down because these are going to be really important to you. How do you live your life here in the garden? You know, write down these things. Let's, let's make a textbook. Let's make a, a Bible, so to speak. Nah, that wasn't there. Okay, because it was relational, and we've talked about that before. They walked with him. The intimacy of intercourse, discussion, that kind, that was going on to some extent in the garden. And the idea of knowing good and evil, they didn't look at the world that way. Oh, this is bad. This is all the, the only thing they knew, God said, don't eat from that tree. And even Eve gets that wrong. <laughs> at one point. So this is the world that they're in. Is that our world today? Okay, election comes up and you got two politicians running for your vote. What is? What do they tell you? Do they tell you, um, do they tell you things that are necessarily true? Or do they tell you things that you may want to hear based upon what you believe is good and evil, good and evil, based upon how it affects you rather than the whole of society? See, people, people make, uh, with the fl flesh, when they're in the flesh, selfish choices. They just as soon get theirs rather than Everybody share equally, and we talked about those two economic systems. So that's that's what we get here. First of all, our eyes are open. We go, oh my goodness, you know, there's choice here. We got to choose what's going to profit us and what's going to harm us. What's good and evil, and that's how they look at good and evil in terms of themselves. How it lifts me up. Remember that vertical thing, lifts me up. See. Because that's where we get that from, is Lucifer himself, who looked at God, said, I see what this is all about. God wants me to worship him. God wants to be lifted up. And guess what? I think I'll lift myself up. And then he goes to Eve and convinces her that's what she needs. And then Adam follows her into this because he wants to be with her rather than God at this point. Because... Um, She's more attractive than God. We talked a little bit about the implications of that. So, so when, when I've got here, no good and evil. Do we really know good and evil? Because see, good and evil starts with what? Some rules that are written down? What does it start with? Good spirit, God. An evil spirits, Lucifer, the fallen angels, the demons that come later. See, good and evil isn't a matter of do this or don't do that. That, that gets put into the law to expose that you're not good. <laughs> that you, you look at the world selfishly. It's not put there as an instruction to live by these rules. Because... You want to live by the intimacy of hearing your Savior, Jesus. Because what's coming up on the world, your systems or your choices based upon you wanting to choose what you think is good for you, your family, and everything, that, 
that may help a little bit, but that's not ultimately what's going to get you through the toughest times. You know, it's just not. But Jesus will. The intimacy of the shepherd and sheep, the intimacy of the marriage of the church to Jesus, that's what's going to get you through. That actually becomes the wind that moves you. And you don't really need to know where it's moving you because it's a matter of faith. See, that's the that's that's what God wants. That's why it says in the scripture that um, what pleases God. You fall in the rules. Do you see anywhere in the scripture where it says, "Oh, um, we're going to have this great throne judgment, and uh, we're going to judge people based upon how well they." Fit follow the law. No, we're going to, the judgment is between life and death. The law leads to death, separation. That's what Paul said. He, it doesn't lead in, to life. It leads to death. But Jesus, the wind, spirit that Jesus sent to move you, it will move you into life. You hear the sh uh, shepherd's voice. You follow him. You and you do that by faith. You do that by trust. This whole system here takes no trust. What does it take? It takes your ability to sort out what is right and wrong and make every decision perfectly based upon knowledge. Okay. Now, here's where we get into where the world is. And I've got up here the sales pitch. Okay. When you go in to buy something, is the salesman going to present to you what you he thinks you want to hear, the good side of what he's trying to sell you, is there, or is he going to put point out all the negatives? For example, you go in and maybe you're going to buy a new car. And you go in and you want to, you know, look important. So maybe I'm going to buy real expensive car, or I want a cool, I want all the chicks to get me, so I'm going to buy, you know, a real sporty thing, okay, and so the salesman sets down, and he says, he figures out what you want to buy, and, and what's motivating you, he'll try to figure out what's motive, what's actually moving in you, is it God's wind, or is it your wind, the spirit, these evil spirits wind, that have convinced you that if you had the right car, ah, you'd be important, you'd, you'd be happy. What, you know, that's what these things convince you. So when he sees you, he tries to, so he tells you, oh, yeah, you'll, you'll look snazzy behind that wheel, you know. I remember the first car I bought, one of the first cars I bought, and I can remember because I was never too great of a looking guy, and I'm short, and, you know, I'm not really... Um, your uh, Cano Reeves or any of these stars. Uh, I, I don't even know who the modern ones are, so I have to always use uh, uh, the people I know, uh, Tom Cruise and that. I'm not that. So, uh, but he knew or he suspected that when I went in there to buy that car, I knew that I need something to attract the girl. So he's telling me about this car and it's just, Oh, yeah, you'll, you'll look really great behind this car, this wheel, you know. Uh, and, and he's got me sold, and then I ask him how much it is, and then what? Then comes the payment. Here comes the negative, the cost of your desires. See, the cost of Adam's desire for Eve was what? Separation from God. See? So every decision you make in the flesh is a calculation based upon um, cost and benefit. That's what we would say in economics. And you have an enemy when you're making the decision here. He knows in some ways you're hedonistic. You want more pleasure than you want cost. So what does he do? He accentuates the things you want to hear. But what does he do? He de-emphasizes the cost. And I remember looking at the thing and I'm saying, okay, 
what's this cost? You know, this snazzy, everybody's going to look at me. It's going to be wonderful. What's it cost? Okay. And he does some calculations and all of that, and he gives me a figure. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay. Hmm. I Now I know the cost. I now I'm, I, now the cost is a dollar figure per month. Okay, because by and so I know what that is, and in some respects I know what that represents because it's money, and I know how many whatever I have to do, how many hours I've got to work, all of that uh, to buy that car, and it, if you know, and then some people really do. They sit down, they calculate that, and they say, okay, well I'm going to have to work um, in a uh, forty-hour week. You know, I got to work 10 hours for this car. I got a 25% of my time working is going to go into that car. A lot of people don't do that because the salesman is telling them it's not, it's really a good deal. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we don't have many of these cars and, you know, the prices are going up and especially today with inflation and all of that. So so people tend to tend to underestimate the cost of something because they don't have perfect knowledge. Again, they're operating under this desire, this hedonism, and they're more prone to exaggerate the benefits and underestimate the costs. And that's where we get into uh, the sales pitch, when I'm talking the sales pitch. When these people who are controlling our financial systems, our, our government, everything, their job is to convince you that they are what I might call the huckleberry. And that relates to in the a long time ago, um, if something met your needs, it was called your huckleberry. Okay. Oh, this is your huckleberry. You really need this. Uh, in uh, the movie uh, Wyatt Earp or... Uh, that had Val Kilmer in, and he played the played uh, uh, Doc Holliday, who was sick and stuff, and he was trying to save the life of his friend uh, Wyatt. And so he arranges to have the gunfight before Wyatt, because he he knows Wyatt can't beat him, but he can't. And he tells the guy who wants to kill people, "I'm your Huckleberry, you know. Come on, you know, yeah." And, of course, it doesn't go well for that guy. Doc Holliday uh, kills him and saves his friend. But So this is the whole system that's going on here, the sales patch. Now what about the bank failures? Okay. Um, here's what's behind this. Let's start asking some questions to see what's behind this. Okay. Uh, we've talked before about the fiat currency, uh, the Federal Reserve note, what we call the dollar, is uh, is a dead instrument. Why it had value at one time is because it was the it was the currency that you had to buy or you had to possess to buy anything internationally. It's called uh, the fiat uh, was called the late in the 70s they called it the petrol dollar so to buy pet uh, gas or oil from anybody you had to change your currency into the petrol dollar and then um, uh, you change your currency your yens whatever into the petrol dollar and who you bought it for took the petrol dollar and then traded it maybe for their currency so the petrol dollar was in high demand because you couldn't trade internationally without it. Okay, that's no longer the case. Cryptocurrencies, all of these things are competing with the petrol dollar. So, the banks are going to fail. Why? Because the petrol dollar is going to become more and more worthless as the world moves away from the petrol dollar. So that's the that's the banking or the market explanation. 
value of the dollar is going down because there's more dollars than there's demand. It's just like uh, I open up a, a, a little store and I want to sell rocks. Okay. How many of them you think I'm going to sell? Find rocks anywhere. Well, I polish mine up and they're real nice. Well, how, much, how many rocks am I going to sell? Well, I might get a few people. Are they going to pay me big money for it? No, because there's a lot of rocks and the demand for rocks is fairly low. So that's the explanation economically for what's happening. But why is the petrodollar, why are people not using the petrodollar? Well, why are they buying crypto? Because it's devaluing. Why is it devaluing? That's the next question. Demand surely impacts that. But why do you think it is? Why do you think that we have politicians telling us we have to move into the new world order? And the new world order will be a what? A petrodollar or a universal currency? Think of the mark of the beast and all of that. What, what's behind all of this movement here? And I talk to a lot of people that are making a fair amount of money in, in the petro, petrodollar devaluing by putting their money, gold, cryptocurrencies, that right now are making a lot of money. And that's what they're motivated by, by money. They talk to me a little bit and I... They say, well, what about your investments? And I tell them, well, I invest in people. Sadly, <laughs> that, I don't have much money if that's what you're looking for, but I do invest in people. And then they all tell me, well, you're a nice guy and all of that. Okay, um, but let us try to get you to see things the way we are to get investments. And, and I'm like, um, as Christians, we should be asking this question. Is any of this that we see going to be in the new kingdom, in the new Jerusalem? Are we going to buy and sell in the new Jerusalem? If we do, what's going to be the currency? See, these are questions. So we're moving into this great reset and one of the things about cryptocurrency or a digital currency that you, uh, where they can, you know, you get a credit card statement, which is a digital form of money. It tells you what you bought. In fact, the, they're already trying to uh, get rid of guns by having codes that we know you bought a gun. So if we get to a digital currency worldwide, why would they want to do that? Why would they want to do that? Does it give them more control? Can they get you to do things maybe you wouldn't do? You know, I was listening to uh, a guy who was talking about the uh, your phone. In fact, he was one of the founders of one of the big companies. And he says, your phone right now, we can track where you go and everything and that. And we can uh, specifically target sales pitches to you based upon your hedonism, what you like and what you don't like. Okay. Nothing spiritual here. This, what is that? Is that spirit to, to, to track you so that we can specifically target you based upon this rather than you listening up here. Is who do you who do you think's the wind behind that? <laughs> when a politician says, vote for me, I don't care who they are, I'll make your lives better. I'm gonna do this for you. I'm gonna who's behind that? Okay. What is the appeal to? What is it appealing to? Is it the Spirit of God speaking to you that's blowing you by faith to a place that you're not sure where you're going, but you're trusting? Is that what's going on? Or is this dealing with this system here? See, this is why I'm trying to get people to wake up that, and I, I don't care in religious systems. Let's talk about a religious system. 
Um, I <laughs> recently I went to this church and I know the guy who was speaking and it was a very small group. We had a Bible study rather than church because of, uh, and he said as the, as the ser service began or started to begin, we were collecting the offering. He says, by the way, be generous today in your offering. Give, give a lot of money because today's offering goes to the speaker, which was him. And one of the elders goes, no, 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 it doesn't. And, <laughs> but that's not, and he was teasing, okay. But a lot of times in charities and things, what do they do? They appeal to this. They don't appeal to this up here. Um, you know, the, and, and today my wife and I, we were involved in this um, thing at school, reality fair, where they, kids chose a career, had so much money and what it was cost, would cost, and they got to the, how much you give to church and all of that. But what, what the bottom line is, my wife was talking to this one person, and all of a sudden, the guy who was the charity guy or the giving to God, he stands up, says, the, the um, youth group doesn't have enough money to go on its retreat. How many of you are going to give, give, give? Do you think this was the spirit? Or was this trying to manipulate something, sell you something? And there was a kid standing there, and he was already in the negatives uh, because we were at kind of the end of things. So he was a negative. He, he didn't have enough income. And he was like, I, I want to give. And, and she said to him, feed your family first because this was the grocery thing. You got to take care of your own. That's, that's actually what Jesus would do. Take care of your own before you give all of this away to everybody else. Fall for these sales pitches. So, are the banks going to fail? Yes. Why? Why do you think they're going to fail? Don't get lost in the economic explanations because what will happen is you'll try to figure them out and you're like, ah, I don't understand this. And a lot of times, these things we see are aimed at you playing in the Luciferian system rather than turning to God. Now, I've had experiences where I walked into a place, uh, most recently was a McDonald's, and I saw a young guy, I mean, and he, he, he had a pack of cigarettes and everything, and I mean, he was... He, he looked like he had been through the ringer. You know, I, I don't know what his past was like. And I haven't seen him up there at McDonald's register. And he's ordering some. And she's saying what it is. And she's, he's, ah. Oh, and he, he's saying, Jesus, please, Jesus, please. And, and he's got this pack of cigarettes. R religious people right away. I wouldn't give him anything. He's just going to buy cigarettes with it. Okay. But I'm hearing him. Jesus, please, I, I, I want this. And I could have said, you, you shouldn't have bought those cigarettes. But I'm watching this guy, and he's, you know, counting out his money. He doesn't have enough money to buy anything. So I, the Holy Spirit told me, step up to the counter. And I did. And I said, whatever he wants, put on my bill. And he turned around, and he looked at me, and he was shocked. He says, why are you doing this? I'm not. I told him, Jesus is. You were praying to Jesus, and Jesus told me to answer your prayer by buying you dinner. And the guy who was standing there was shocked by what I said. See, that's the difference between listening to the wind and getting so focused on all of this stuff that you get deceived like Eve is and to getting more and more knowledge about the markets and everything so that what? You protect yourself. Do you think that's ever going to work? Does 
all of your dieting and everything protect you against cancer? Some cancers it might help. Can you live in a world where you'll never have any problems by following rules? Or do you want to live in a world where you're connected to the Heavenly Father through the Spirit and the Son who's giving you peace and joy that, I mean, it, it, it just goes beyond. It's, it's, un, and it's, you know, how, how can you be so, so calm when you're going into surgery? Because if I don't come out of it, I'm okay with that. If I come out of it, I'm okay with that. Because I have the peace through the Spirit, not through this. <laughs> that passes all understanding. That's why I'm trying to get people to see. And uh, churchianity really tries to get us to live here. By all of our Bible studies, memorizing rules, and doing the right thing. Adam, when he was in the garden, and God was walking with him, didn't even care what the right and wrong thing was. Really didn't. And if you start to walk with Jesus, you're not going to care about the right and wrong. You'll do it through the Spirit. The Spirit fulfills the law. Jesus fulfills the law. Love fulfills the law. It isn't the rules. These rules... If you start looking at some of these things, start asking, why are people doing what they're doing? Why are they trying to tell me this? Why are they trying to tell me that? And it goes both sides. Why is Joe Biden telling people this? Uh, for example, he, he said, we got to get rid of the guns. Why? Why do you want to get rid of the guns? What spirit's blowing through you that's telling, telling me that I can, that all of the tragedies of people being shot can be stopped by you taking away our guns. What is, what's going on here? What spirit is going? Trump, um, choose me and I'll make America great again. Well, he might make it great for a little while, by, like, like things got improved when he was president. But ultimately, are we building a kingdom here or are we making heavenly investments through the Spirit. See, why start looking behind the flesh and blood world and try to discern what's going on and ask for discernment. And that's why I pray every time. I'm going to pray now. Father, open our eyes to see what is blowing in us and in the world so that we will listen to your son's voice and not to other voices. And I ask this in your son's name, and I ask it for everyone that's on the other side of the screen. May you be blessed. May your eyes be open. And until we meet again, shalom, peace to you.